for module 5, we are to focus on classical sociological theories and the environment. One possible source of inspiration for contemporary sociologists seeking to engage with environmental topics is the canon of classical social theory, notably that bequeathed to us by Durkheim, Weber, and Marx. To a certain extent, each of these sociological pioneers had something significant to say about nature and society. Although this was often more implied than direct and was embedded in the philosophical controversies and scholarly debates of the time in which they were writing. Take note that these theorists were writing in 17th century. The coverage of this module includes, and also it's good to remember that there are many theories written by this a selected theorist. We are just picking out those that are of relevance to our subject. So we're going to take up Emil Durkheim's theory on social facts and division of labor and Max Weber's rationality and Karl Marx's social conflict. First, Emil Durkheim's social facts. It is for him any way of acting, whether fixed or not, meaning it's flexible, capable of exerting over the individual an external constraint. This constraint is normally manifested in the form of law, morality, beliefs, customs, and even fashions. We can verify the existence of a social fact Durkheim ventured by examining an experience that is characteristic. All we need to do is look at our own culture in our society. For example, children are compelled to adopt ways of seeing, thinking, and acting that they otherwise would not have arrived at spontaneously. We were taught what are the ways of our own culture that we cannot see being done by other culture. Okay. In the division of labor in society, that's in 1893, Durkheim describes the evolution of modern societies from a state of mechanical solidarity, wherein social solidarity among people is a product of shared cultural values. So this one evolved this mechanical solidarity into organic solidarity where the social bond among people is a function of interdependence. Interdependence because everybody has now different functions. And one is interdependent with the other. Whereas this one, there is that shared cultural values. So that's the difference between when it was still mechanical and into organic solidarity. So the social, okay, most notably this one, arise out of increasingly complex division of labor. Durkheim's division of labor in society theory was very much an attempt to devise a solution to what is essentially an ecological crisis of rising population paired with scarce resources. So there is now imbalance between the two. As societies became larger and denser, it would have been disastrous if everyone had continued to engage in agriculture. In such reality, all would need a piece of land to till. Increasingly, occupational specialization 
like there are those in teaching now, business, in police works, in transportation, in health. So this meant that the competition over arable land was lessened, even as the last, even as that land became more productive thanks to technological innovation. Now, uh, Weber. Weber's neo-Weberian Weberian environmental sociology. Now, a second sociological pioneer whose work is said to possess an ecologically relevant component uh, wherein his historical sociology of religion and his comparative research on ancient societies. He analyzed concrete examples of struggles over natural resources, for example, the control of irrigation systems. Now, in his book, Economy and Society, the key concept to be extracted here is formal rationalization. It is composed of several dynamic institutional components, increased scientific and technological or technical knowledge brings with it a fresh orientation in which nature exists only to be mastered and manipulated by humans. An expanding capitalist market economy leaves little room for anything beyond a calculating, self-interested pursuit of market domination. Industry and government are controlled by a bureaucratic apparatus, the purpose of which is to attain a high level of efficiency. The legal system operates like a technically rational machine. Together, these components promote a pervasive logic whereby efficiency reigns supreme on occasion even superseding a sensible choice of goals or alternatives, what Weber called as substantive rationality. Now, formal rationality thus dictates that the most efficient action is to clear cut an old growth forest, even if this is in no way substantively rational from an ecological point of view. Okay. Now, two interrelated processes first highlighted by Weber at the beginning of the 20th century that have become distinctive features of our time, the intensification of rationality and the magnification of rationality. The more we try to run things according to the principle of dispassionate calculation, the more we open the door to a swarm of unwanted and negative effects. When applied to the case of nature, this is called ecological irrationality. It is manifested in a wide range of destructive consequences from sensational technological disasters such as nuclear accidents to routine population events such as industrial dumping into urban storm sewers. Growing on another of Weber's concepts, intellectual rationality makes an important point about science, technology, and risk. In contrast to tribal societies, the average individual in an industrial society cannot know more than a minimum about how technology works unless he or she is a physicist. One who rides on the streetcar has no idea how the car happened to get into the motion. Consequently, while one may in principle master all things by intellectual calculation, in reality, we depend on an army of experts to do so. This expectation is inherently problematic because a minority of the time, 
these experts fumble the ball leading to potential and sometimes actual environmental emergencies. Now, Karl Marx, of the three main sociological traditions, it is that associated with Karl Marx that has provoked their most extensive response from present-day environmental interpreters. Marx and Engels, that is his partner, Sir Friedrich Engels, believe that social conflict between the two principal classes in society, because for Karl Marx, there are two classes of people in society, the bourgeois and the proletariat. The bourgeois are the capitalists, or we refer to as the haves. So they have, they have the capital, they have the business, they own the production of society. The, proletari um, the proletariat are the workers or the have-nots. They alienate ordinary people from their jobs, but also lead to their estrangement from nature itself. Nowhere is this more evident than in capitalist agriculture, which puts a quick profit from the land ahead of the welfare of both humans and the soil. As the Industrial Revolution proceeded through the 18th and 19th centuries, rural workers were removed from the land and driven into crowded, polluted cities while the soil itself was drained of its vitality. In short, a single factor that is capitalism was held responsible for a wide range of social ills from overpopulation and resource depletion to the alienation of people from the natural world with which they were once united. By contrast, in Marx's early work, the concept of the humanization of nature is proposed. This suggests that humans will develop a new understanding of the empathy with nature. A key question here is whether this new understanding would be used solely for human emancipation or whether it would take a more ecocentric form in which the powers and capacities of non-human species would be enhanced. In the former case, the humanization of nature might in fact be deployed to eliminate species of organisms that threaten human health. Marx provided a powerful analysis of the main ecological crisis of his day, the problem of soil fertility with capitalist agriculture, as well as commenting on the other major ecological crises of his time, like the loss of forests, the pollution of the cities, and the Malthusian specter of overpopulation. In doing so, he raised fundamental issues about the antagonism of town and country the necessity of ecological sustainability and what he called the metabolic relation between human beings and nature. Marx employed the concept of metabolism to describe the complex interaction between society and nature. Metabolism, he observed, constitutes the fundamental basis on which life is sustained and growth and production become possible. By the 1800s in particular, this organic relationship was, was being seriously undercut by the practices of capitalist agriculture. Most notably, landowners were accused of callously rubbing the soil of its key nutrients by declining to recycle them. This, of course, is exactly what is still occurring, especially where monoculture or a single variety of a single crop grown for commercial profit prevail. Marx describes this as metabolic rift, the estrangement 
of human beings from the natural world of the soil. This paralleled the estrangement of workers from their labor and was attributable to the same source, capitalism. Rather than a huckster for chemical agriculture, Marx appears to have been an early advocate of organic farming methods. For example, he writes at length about the benefits of spreading manure on croplands, even suggesting that human waste from the city be recycled as fertilizer rather than polluting the rivers and oceans. The importance of Marx's theory of metabolic rift lies not just on advocacy of organic agriculture, but also application of sociological thinking to the ecological realm. This is one of the great triumphs of classic sociological analysis and proof that ecological analysis devoid of sociological insight is incapable of dealing with the contemporary crisis of the earth. Furthermore, it provides a portal through which contemporary sociological analysts might better understand the metabolic relation between humans and nature. Metabolic rift can lead to increases in greenhouse gas emissions. Three ways this occurs are specified here. The increased transportation of natural resources necessitated by urbanization. And there is that the replacement of organic matter by chemical fertilizers. And the diversion of methane generating organic waste to landfill rather than back into the soil. Okay. So because of urbanization, there is increased transport of natural resources. And that instead of organic matter, chemical fertilizer. And that instead of uh, putting back into the soil, into landfill. Ends.